losing my mind. I've been driving way too long. With not much daylight left, my last stop on my three-city tour of the Lycus Valley would have to be quick. It was a town called Colosse, and this one was completely unexcavated, deep inside a massive mound of earth that rises above the Lycus Valley floor. There were a few remains of pillars and various and sundry ruins that peeked out of the ground along the road to ancient Colosse. But strangely, I enjoyed thinking that this city that lay untouched deep in the earth was the recipient of not one, but two New Testament letters, documents that would establish their place among the most influential in world history. The Apostle Paul didn't start the church in Colossae, but sent the man who did, Epaphras. When word got back to Paul, who had been put under arrest in Rome, that false teachers were stirring things up in Colossae, he decided to write the letter to the Colossians to correct their errors. The content of this false teaching is now lost, but we can piece it together based on what Paul wrote to refute it. Paul wrote against what he called a hollow and deceptive philosophy, which had found its way to Colossae because of its diverse population. Instead, Paul taught the true philosophy of Christ, in whom, he said, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There must have been some kind of higher knowledge in Colossae that was trying to downplay the central role of Jesus Christ in Christian theology. Many scholars also think that there were the early seeds of a false teaching called Gnosticism in Colossae. Now the word Gnosticism comes from the Greek word Gnostikos, which means good at knowing, and it implied a special class of elite people who had an inside track to higher and secret knowledge. Gnosticism also teaches that everything that is spirit is good, and everything that is matter is evil. Because of this, the false teachers were telling the Colossians not only to worship angels and consider them higher than Christ himself, but also to refuse certain foods and festivals as if doing so would qualify them as better Christians. One of the most significant things Colossians teaches is the radically world-changing idea that in the newly made community of Christians, God shows no favoritism. Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, circumcised or uncircumcised. Even slaves and free people share equal status in Christ. He completely obliterates any notion of one group of Christians being better or closer to God than another group. In Christ, Paul says, you share the same status before God as anyone else. In the first century, this was a radical and even dangerous idea especially in an age when the emperor determined the value of an individual, and one out of every five people were slaves, and therefore thought of as disposable property. Some would say that this Christian idea of equality has done more to influence the bedrock of justice and fairness in Western civilization than anything else. It's no accident, for example, that echoes of this idea can be found in America's founding documents. That all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Because of Paul's teaching that in Christ there is no distinction between slave and free, it should come as no surprise that he would attract slaves as friends. And that's exactly what happened. In fact, he became friends with a runaway slave from a member of this very Colossian church. The slave's name was Onesimus, and his master's name was Philemon. While on the run, Onesimus, who had stolen from his master Philemon, landed himself in prison in either Ephesus or Rome. That's where he met Paul, and was converted by Paul's message of the gospel. So thoroughly life-changing was this conversion that Onesimus was actually willing to return to his master Philemon back in Colossae. Paul's request for Philemon to accept Onesimus back into his household is what we now have in the New Testament, the letter to Philemon. Philemon had every right to punish Onesimus when he returned, but Paul urges him to receive him no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. 
But could the runaway Onesimus be trusted to willingly go all the way back to his master in Colossae? I think we can assume that he did. After all, if he had continued to run, how would we have ever known about the letter? Colossae never completely recovered from the great earthquake in 60 AD, and its ruins still lie untouched deep inside this mound of earth. But more powerful than the earthquake that destroyed the town, the two short letters written to the small Colossian church have provided some of the most foundational ideas on which our entire civilization is based. As important today as they were in the first century, the words of an apostle of Jesus Christ to the people of this small town have gone on to plant seeds of freedom and equality in the hearts of people around the world. But the work is not yet complete. And as Jesus said, the fields are ripe for the harvest.